This is almost flogged. It was 1999 and I had heard how the women in Afghanistan were not able to leave their houses. They weren't allowed to go to school or have jobs. They weren't allowed to sing or dance. How they were beaten for wearing the wrong colored socks. I had heard how they were forced to be covered any time they were in public and some were sick from lack of exposure to the sun. There was something about the lack of outrage surrounding the state of Afghan women. Something about the acceptance of it made me fear for the future of all women. Freshta was 26, thin, pale, and haunted. She was an undercover reporter who traveled across Afghanistan, risked her life to document the, the atrocities of the Taliban, the fundamentalist Muslim regime that controlled her home country. On Fridays, Freshta said, the Taliban closes the shops and streets in Kabul and forces all the people, children included, into a stadium. There they must watch as thieves have their hands cut off and are hanged from trees. Yet the Taliban is what has made these people so poor they must steal. I've seen women stoned to death in the stadium for refusing arranged marriages. She reported on other atrocities. A six-year-old girl was beaten for carrying school books in public. Two cousins, a boy and a girl, were buried alive for talking in the bazaar. Commanders abducted and raped girls. The girls don't want to be interviewed, Freshta said, because they are ashamed. I interview their mothers, who usually say, our daughters are dead to us. Freshta told me that since she became a reporter, she started fainting all the time. That didn't stop her. As long as I have the ability to publicize the shocking situation of my people, I will continue. I hope I will live to see the elimination of these criminals. Freshta reported for the newsletter and website of Rawa the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan. More than 2,000 members of this clandestine network provided shelter, education, and medical services to Afghan women and girls, all in defiance of the Taliban. Unable to show their faces in their own country, they built international connections through their website. I found them by email. After interviewing me at a hotel in Peshawar, Pakistan, and making sure I was trustworthy, Rawa's leaders agreed to show me their schools and orphanages. It helped secure me passage into Afghanistan to witness firsthand life under the Taliban. My journey began in Pakistan, home to 1.2 million refugees who had fled the Taliban. The city I agreed not to name, the driver sympathetic to Rawa's mission took us down narrow, garbage-strewn streets until we reached an unmarked house. Behind a gate, unseen from the street, a guard armed with a machine gun stood watch. He led us inside, where we found clean, ordered classrooms decorated with brightly colored pillows. Rawa operated a dozen schools like this one in Pakistan, some in desert refugee camps, others in Rawa members' own houses. In Afghanistan itself, Rawa ran 65 schools and 33 orphanages, all housed secretly in private homes. In Pakistan, the schools faced harassment and rage by Taliban sympathizers. But in Afghanistan, both students and teachers risked death. Rawa rotated school locations in strictly limited class sizes to avoid detection. Women studying at the school I visited, refugees of every age, told me their stories in turn. A member of the pet Taliban struck me with a stick because I wasn't wearing a burqa, said a manic 48-year-old widow, referring to the long Afghan garment that provides only a small opening for air and sight. I fell face down on a stone. No operation will fix it. She showed me her knee, swollen and deformed. Various women showed me scars of whips on their bodies, mainly their ankles. Then the women brought out a television and VCR and put in a videotape. They were nervous and edgy. Freshta had smuggled the camera under her veil into a stadium in Kabul. On the screen, we saw about nine Taliban men arrive at the stadium in the back of a Toyota pickup truck. Soon another truck appeared carrying three women covered in burqas. A man with a microphone read from the Koran. One of the women was led into the center of the stadium and thrown to the ground. A Taliban man placed his gun to her head and without pause fired it. We never even saw her face. Wails and cries filled the stadium. The dead woman was left on the ground like garbage. As the video went on, the wailing continued. It took me several moments to realize that it was coming from the room I was in. Then Frischta suddenly lurched into my arms in convulsions. Watching the video had re-stimulated the trauma she had witnessed in the stadium, 
She no longer had her camera between her and the horror. Her body was flailing and thrashing about. As I tried to hold her and comfort her, the re-traumatization spread instantly through the room. Women were crying and agitated. Suddenly, Freshness' four-year-old daughter, having heard her mother's cries, came running into the room. The underlying world of stress, sorrow, and terror the women lived with became apparent. Rawa's founder, a poet and activist named Mina Keshwar Kamal, was 20 years old when she founded the, the group in 1977, hopes of gaining equal rights for Afghan women. At the time, this cause was not yet life or death. Women were earning PhDs and working as doctors, lawyers, and teachers. If they wore the burqa, it was out of religious preference, not in enforced obedience to national law. But in 1979, Soviet troops invaded the country to back the communist government then in power, and Islamic and tribal groups known as jihadi mounted armed opposition. When Rawa staged public protests opposing the communists and the jihadi with equal passion, Mina paid for it with her life. In 1987, she was killed in her home in Quetta, Pakistan, by the Afghan KGB and their fundamentalist accomplices. After her death, Rawa members went underground, determined to complete what their leader had begun. After Mina's assassination, Rawa had no single leader that would leave them too vulnerable. Instead, the group had been directed by a rotating council of 12 women. Men support, protect, love, and marry Rawa members, but they cannot join the organization. Washed over by bodyguards, the council meets every three months, both in and outside of Afghanistan. At the end of each meeting, members decide where they will next convene. They tell no one else of their plans. In Pakistan, we met journalists who had been waiting many months to get into Afghanistan. We were very lucky. Within a week, after an extraordinary intervention on our behalf by the International Rescue Committee, we secured the visas we needed. We were escorted by Sunita, a sweet 20-year-old woman who had been on only one other mission for Rawa in Afghanistan. If questioned, we agreed to say that we were tourists and Sunita was our translator. Sunita was required to don the suffocating burqa. As a foreigner, I was permitted to cover myself with a scarf instead. Notebooks, cameras, and cell phones were banned. We bought the first two anyway. An armed Pakistani policeman traveled with us through the Khyber Pass to protect us from bandits on the road. When checkpoint officials along the route through the Himalayas seemed ready to turn us away, we waved his Russian-made machine gun and they let us through. At the border, however, Taliban guards forced us out of our car. They claimed we did not have the right permit for the car, so we had to leave it. So we actually walked across the border into Afghanistan, our luggage in tow. At the Afghani border, there were Taliban members doing interviews and checking IDs. I got picked to do the talking. A large, intimidating man asked me why I had come to Afghanistan. I mumbled something about the country being in my dreams, that I had always felt an affinity for it. He asked me what I was doing there. I stumbled and said I was a playwright and I was interested in theater. He stared at me and said, There is no theater in Afghanistan. There is only the Koran. I said something really stupid like, well, that would be interesting as well. I was sure I'd totally blown it, but for some, for some reason he let us pass. We hired a new driver who loaded us into a decrepit station wagon, took us a long way through the desert to Jalalabad. Fortunately, I was fairly ignorant about Afghanistan then. I learned only later that the city was the stronghold of Al-Qaeda. There we checked into a hotel. Like all public lodgings, it was run by the Taliban. And judging from the urinal in our bathroom, were probably the first women to ever stay there. On the entrance to the hotel, there was a sign with an image of a machine gun and a huge X through it. Leave your AK-47s at the door. Sunita set up a covert Rawa meeting for that evening so we could meet the women who were doing the underground work. We covered ourselves in burqas in an attempt to blend in and avoid being followed. Three of us, under miles of fabric, squeezed into a tiny cab smaller than a golf cart. Almost immediately, the heat became unbearable. I gasped for breath. I tried to be brave, but it was useless. I'm insanely claustrophobic. We took a circuitous route to a Rawa school, a house indistinguishable from the impoverished dwellings that surrounded it. The young teacher told me that 35 small classes were held there, teaching science, math, and reading. The literacy rate among women in Afghanistan was now 4%, she told me. Without education, there was no hope of raising a generation strong enough to defy the Taliban. The students arrive at different times one by one, exclaimed the teacher. 
someone knocks on the door, we hide the blackboard. Students have so much interest in school. Most don't know it's run by Rawa. They know that if the Taliban sees them learning, they could die. I interviewed the women. They were teachers. They were devoted. They knew the price for teaching was flogging or death by execution. They risked their lives so the future of the women in their country might be secure. And abruptly, the interviews ended. We were told in hushed tones that we had to go immediately. If we were seen outside after the 9 p.m. curfew, there would be trouble. The women hugged and kissed us again and again. They pleaded with us to tell their stories to the world. They had no self-pity. I'd heard that the, that, that the Taliban beat women who ate ice cream in public. Sometimes they even beat them if they ate it under their burqa. It was perceived to be lascivious and lewd. This haunted me. I couldn't stop bringing it up. Finally, Sunita told me they were going to give me a special treat, take me to the secret ice cream eating place for women. We walked through a crowded bazaar and into a broken down restaurant. In the back, sheets were hung from the ceilings to create a makeshift room. Sunita and I walked in and sat down and the sheets were pulled around us. We waited nervously as the terrified restaurant owners watched outside and then, when the moment was right, arrived with bowls of vanilla ice cream. I watched Sunita lift her burqa and slowly and carefully eat the cool, sweet ice cream. In that moment, she became a child. In the time before women were locked away without schools or jobs, they could still laugh and see the sky. For that moment, no one had control over her. Sunita and the women of Afghanistan had, in the midst of total oppression and brutality, found a way to keep their pleasure and desire alive. She savored a few mouthfuls. Then we were warned the Taliban men were circling the bazaar in their Toyota pickups. We pulled down our burqas and the sweet taste and daylight were gone. Some part of me feared I would never get out of Afghanistan. Indeed, as we drove back to Pakistan a few days later, our car was stopped by a member of the dreaded Department for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, DPVPV. He was huge, a mass of long hair and a dirty beard. I'd stopped wearing a burqa in the car, and he caught me with a small scarf on my head. He ordered me out of the car. He was clutching a wooden paddle attached to what was a long, flat, wide leather whip used for flogging. I recalled the black and blue ankles of the women I met at the first Rawa school, the way she still had trouble walking. He was raging and screaming in a language I didn't speak but totally understood. He went into a kind of disassociated place that was calmly and oddly familiar. I thought of women living like this every day and having no recourse or way out. I felt the insane powerlessness, the rage that is mean and different ugliness. I realized I could die there or be severely beaten. It was in this moment that I came to understand misogyny in my body and being. I understood how quickly and easily women could be treated as animals. I understood that the situation of these women was unacceptable, and that if allowed to continue, it would impact all of us. Because that kind of brutality, left unchecked, left unchecked, creates an environment of inhumanity that is contagious. Pleas and protestations from our driver somehow saved me. The mad flogger waved us on with disgust. When I returned to the United States, I brought Freshness videotape and an article I'd written about my experience in Afghanistan to several TV stations and major publications. With the exception of one magazine, Mary Claire, I could not engender any interest in the story. No one could understand that the terrible plight of Afghan women had to do with their own interests, their own comfort and security. Under the burqa, this poem is for the brave, tender, fierce women of Afghanistan who not only survived, but kept their country alive. Wearing a burqa should obviously be a matter of culture and choice. This piece is about a time and place when women, when women had no choice. Imagine a huge, dark piece of cloth hung over your entire body like you're a shameful statue. Imagine there's only a drop of light, enough to know there's still daylight for others. Imagine it's hot, very hot. Imagine you're encased in cloth, drowning in fabric, in darkness. Imagine you're begging under this bedstread, reaching out your hand, which must remain covered, unpolished, unseen, or they might smash it or cut it off. Imagine no one is putting rubles in your invisible hand, as no one can see your face, so you do not exist. Imagine you cannot find your children because they came for your husband, the only man you ever loved, even though it was an arranged marriage, because they came and shot him, you tried to defend him, and they trampled you. 
four men on your back in front of your screaming children. Imagine you go mad. You do not know you are mad because you're living under a bedspread. You haven't seen the sun in years and you've lost your way. And you remember your two daughters vaguely like a dream, the way you remember Sky. Imagine muttering as a way of talking because words do not form anymore in the darkness. Imagine you do not cry because it gets too hot and wet in there. Imagine bearded men that you can only decipher by their smell, beating you because your socks are white. Imagine being flogged, beaten in the streets, in front of people you cannot see. Imagine being humiliated so deeply that there is no face attached to it and no air. It gets darker there. Imagine no peripheral vision, so like a wounded animal you cannot defend yourself. You've been ducked from the side when it blows. Imagine that laughter is banned throughout your country and music and the only sounds you hear, the muffled sounds of the limousine, the cries of other women flogged inside their cloth, inside their dark. Imagine you can no longer extinguish between living and dying so you stop trying to kill yourself because it would be redundant. Imagine you have no place to live. Your only roof is the cloth as you wander the streets. This tomb is getting smaller and smellier every day. You're beginning to walk into things. Imagine suffocating while you're still breathing. Imagine muttering and screaming inside a cage. No one is hearing. Imagine me inside the inside of the darkness in you. I'm caught there. I'm lost there. Inside the cloth that is your head. Inside the dark we share. Imagine you can see me. I was beautiful once. Big dark eyes. You would know me. They blew her up because they could not cut her down. I was surprised when I saw my stomach in the barely standing full-length mirror in my room at the Intercontinental Hotel in Kabul, surprised that my stomach was not huge. It was lean, but lean the way an older body looks lean. It was not clean lean. I was surprised that it was not full, pouring out, full of the dust that had fallen and continued to fall over everything, full of the cold, shivering impoverishment that crept deeper into one's skin, full of the loss. There's nothing green, nothing whole, nothing working, nothing dependable here. Full of the stupidity that had leveled concrete, shattered glass, smashed wood. There were very few roofs. There was nothing to eat. Full of the stories. Stories like thoughtless episodes that come out of nowhere and undo everything forever. The story the orphan girl told of the Taliban breaking into her family's house in mazar e sharif They'd been eating dinner. The Taliban insisted, as they often did, her father built a fire to make them warm and her mother go quickly and cook for them. Her brother was sent to get petrol for the gas stove. The mother anxiously set about cooking. Nothing was moving fast enough. Her brother rushed with the gas and accidentally dropped it on the floor, which started a fire. The Taliban, now convinced the family was mocking them, trying to set them on fire, argued outside with the father. He was desperate to convince him it was an accident and returned to his screaming son, now on fire in the living room. The son was completely burned. The father rushed into the house too late and burned most of his upper body, trying to save what was left of his son. He was unable to work ever again. The mother lost her mind. Or the story of the bomb that fell accidentally from an open car door into the river. Several weeks later, an orphan girl's brother, who was her twin and her best friend, came upon the bomb while playing in the water with his friends. They wrestled with it and rode it and brought it out of the river. It exploded in their hands blowing them each to pieces. Stories, full of stories, full of the emptiness that comes when hope, the reason for tomorrow, is blown away. Full of the smells that remained after everything is charred. Full of the body, the female body, that goes on anyway, despite madness, despite losing one's husband, despite dust. Full of misery. I look at my stomach in the full-length mirror that could shatter as everything else had. My stomach, which usually had instincts, or at the very least hunches, was now mute, not knowing anything, stunned by the massive acts of cruelty, years of cruelty, stunned into utter submission. I was starving and there was nothing to eat. There was nothing that would make this better. Unless we were to start over again as a species, we were able to admit that we had spun off in the wrong direction, we were able to just stop. I wondered if even that would make things better to remove the mask of pure cruelty, the stain of violence in the cellular structure, the stain that now directed and redirected everything. We are products of violence, each and every one of us. We are its outcome and its creation. 
Here in Kabul, the dust is gathered, got so deeply and quickly into your lungs that it created something called the Kabul cough. What was left after the buildings and mosques and people were gone got into your lungs, making you cough and gag. Here in this history of invasion, usurpation, domination, obliteration, interrogation, the dust was the new weather. If it rained, the dust became mud. When there was heat, a thermal lining. We walked through a public garden, thick in mud. The soldiers who stood outside to guard it guided us through. It was as if they were now guarding a memory, a knowledge of another time in Kabul that was luscious and green, when the almond groves and apple trees and roses were alive in the sun. The dancing rooms in the theater thrived. The soldiers guarding this story walked us around, pointing out what was once there. You could smell the greenness. Even though most of the trees were skeletons and stumped, we could remember their blooming. The soldiers became tender, proud, and they described the dancing. They told of the days of joy. Those days were not days they remembered. They'd been born into dust. It was the memory of their parents, of their parents' parents, that they needed to trust. These soldiers, no more than 21, had never lived without the Kabul cough. It was like an allergy. You got used to it. They walked us around until we came upon what had once been the most beautiful tree in the garden. We stood around its charred remains, an open, wounded, blackened trunk in the ground. It had once been the grandest tree of all. When the Taliban took the garden, they had chopped down most of the ancient trees for kindling to keep themselves warm. They had tried to chop this tree, but it would not come down. So one night, they put a bomb in the trunk and blew it up. Blew it up. The most beautiful, the grandest and greenest, the most luscious, the holder of hope tree. They blew her up. Now there's a blackened out hole in the ground. I remembered this tree. Maybe it was my mother's memory or her mother's memory. Someone must remember before there were landmines and guns and bombs. Someone must remember before the dust seemed so familiar, for the dust seemed like the future. The soldiers blew her up because they could not cut her down. I held fast to the memory of greenness as I coughed. I saw the garden alive. I held fast to my belief that we will one day survive the beauty. We will surrender to it rather than blow it up.